Hello, everybody. Welcome. Nice to see everybody. And Happy New Year. So as always, I want to speak about this idea of new beginnings, the beginning of the new year in the context of enlightenment to the awakening to enlightened awareness. So when I'm speaking in these, I'm giving these talks, it's always in a very unique context. And so it's context specific. So I want to speak about this idea of the beginning of the year, new beginnings, looking through the lens of enlightened awareness or my understanding of enlightened awareness. If enlightenment is what we're interested in more than anything else, and if we're very sincere or serious about attaining enlightened awareness, we're very serious about being on the path and succeeding on that path, then a new beginning is not something that we want to experience once a year, but a new beginning is a state of consciousness. We see and understand the, the whole idea of a new beginning as a state of consciousness, as a fundamental relationship to being alive. So enlightenment is, a, in, is an experience and is a, is a state of consciousness and it's a particular position that we take in relationship to the human experience. And that's what I wanted to speak about today. What does a new beginning mean? A new beginning means two things. A new beginning means nothing is wrong and everything is possible. when we experience higher states of consciousness, when we awaken to the bliss of enlightened awareness, when we have our deepest and most profound insights into the nature of reality as a whole, part and parcel of that experience is the shocking recognition that nothing is wrong and that all things are possible. When we wake up from relative reality, relative consciousness, relative cognition to absolute reality, absolute consciousness and absolute cognition, we flip and the flip is something is wrong, something, something fundamental is wrong and so little is possible to nothing's wrong and everything is possible, all things are possible. It's a big flip, it's a completely different perspective. So once again, when we wake up, from relative consciousness, relative cognition, and relative reality to absolute consciousness, absolute cognition, and absolute reality. The flip goes from something is terribly wrong and nothing is possible to nothing is wrong and everything is possible. So it's quite a shift. It's not a relative shift, it's an absolute shift. And this is of course what I emphasize all the time because that's what I teach. That's the shift from unenlightenment to enlightenment from relative reality to absolute reality. So the experience of consciousness of the new beginning is identical. When you have a few moments of waking consciousness and cognition where you experience the sense, the inner, the inner sense or the conviction of a new beginning, you get to start all over again. The, the, the feeling experience is based upon the recognition that nothing is wrong and simultaneously that all things are possible. But if we're interested in awakening to enlightened awareness, the state of consciousness that is enlightened awareness, we have a very bold aspiration and that bold aspiration is to live in that state of consciousness that nothing is wrong and that all things are possible all the time. That's the goal. That's what we wanna to work towards, but not in a way that's, that's diluted or pregnant with avoidance or denial. In the spiritual experience, this recognition of new beginnings is part and parcel of the experience of a higher state of consciousness. It's the experience of a higher state of consciousness. It's the experience of a different plane, a different and higher and deeper plane of reality itself. And when we awaken to this higher plane of reality, this higher plane of consciousness. If we are 
we, if we're intelligent and reflective people, we're intelligent and reflective souls, sensitive and um, paying attention to the nature of our experience, we all know that life, that the experience of life and the experience of being human is so much more pleasing when we're not burdened with angst and fear and doubt and despair and brokenness and woundedness. So brokenness, woundedness, woundedness down and despair and the karmic, the heavy karmic repercussions of those kinds of feelings and those kinds of uh, wounds repeatedly give us a very different message. And so if you're, con if you're convinced there's something fundamentally wrong because you feel wounded, because you feel there's something fundamentally wrong with being alive, there's something wrong with, as, I, as I've often explained, if you've been traumatized at some point in your life, if you've experienced a deep wounding, one that you have not healed from, not have recovered from. This, what's called a core wound, creates a conscious or unconscious belief system. It's an unconscious or unconscious belief system. And this unconscious, conscious or unconscious belief system goes something like, there's something fundamentally wrong with me. And inadvertently, almost every time, we knowingly or unknowingly, and usually it's unknowingly, draw the conclusion that there's something wrong with life itself. Life sucks, so to speak. And it's usually it's understood from a relative point of view, from a relative human point of view, it's understandable. If we've been hurt, wounded, or traumatized, we've had a hard time, and we're suffering, it's reasonable to conclude that something is wrong with life itself. Very reasonable and understandable. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just trying to make a point. And then the, then with the next step is that, of course, if you think there's something wrong with life itself, our relationship to life and to the experience of being human and the infinite creative and personal opportunities of being human will be viewed with doubt, fear, and suspicion. We might end up being cynical about our own capacities to be happy and to succeed and to love and be loved and end up in a kind of free-floating cynicism and nihilism without even clearly understanding how we got there. Now, the thing about the spiritual experience or the awakening to enlightened awareness, the thing about the, the big spiritual experiences is as I keep repeating, we flip from relative consciousness and relative cognition, relative reality to absolute consciousness, absolute cognition, and absolute reality. And we discover on these higher and deeper planes of conscious experience, we discover a couple of things. One is that these higher and deeper planes of experience and realms of, re realms of reality, we recognize that they feel palpably more real. When you wake up to higher states of consciousness, one of the hallmarks of these higher states is that, oh, this is, this has more, this is about to be more real, more authentic, more fundamental, more truthful. And that's why the experience of these higher states of consciousness and the awakening to enlightened awareness is so liberating because, in, in, because when we experience these higher states of consciousness, we experience liberation and a freedom from our darkest convictions about the nature of reality and the nature of the human experience and our own woundedness. Suddenly, we suddenly, suddenly, what we felt was insurmountable grief, insurmountable fear, insurmountable doubt is replaced by a, a what's felt to be a deeper and more authentic experience of consciousness and, and cognition than any, any of our other experiences has ever been. More inherently meaningful. So when we live our life from this, from the state of unenlightenment, from the perspective of relative reality, relative con con consciousness and cognition, we see the world through the, through the lens <clears throat> of our woundedness and our fears and our doubts and our despair. When we awaken to enlightened awareness, we see the world through the lens of the awakened mind and the awakened heart and the awakened soul. We see the human experience, the experience of consciousness and cognition 
the experience of mind, body, world, and universe through a lens of liberated consciousness, liberated knowing. So the experience of being alive and the experience of being human is very different. The kind of decisions you're going to make if you think there's something fundamentally wrong with you, you think there's something fundamentally wrong with life itself, the kind of decisions you're going to make in relationship to your life choices will be very different, obviously. And if you make choices, and then if you make important and fundamental life choices from the perspective that nothing is wrong, and then, and then at the deepest level, you're fundamentally free. So, from the perspective of enlightened awareness, from the perspective of a life lived in pursuit of enlightened awareness, a new beginning, the state of new beginnings, the experience of, the experience of new beginnings is what we want to aspire to live in and from every single day. Sometimes it'll be easy, er. Sometimes it'll be easy, er. It's easy, er. <laughs> it's easier to live the human experience, your very own unique human experience, from the perspective of uh, new beginnings, if you have access to that state of enlightened awareness directly and immediately. It's that higher state of consciousness that makes this so immediate, so palpable, and so real. And when we don't have access to this higher state of consciousness, but we know what that higher state of consciousness is, and we know how important it is, then we start to live our, live our life in such a way where we make that, that state more accessible to us. So that's why, for example, in uh, historically people have chosen to live a religious life, a life infused with awakened awareness, tend to live a life of greater discipline and greater self awareness. So that's why, for example, meditating for long periods of time every day is a good idea because it helps us to gain access to, to, to absolute reality and absolute consciousness and absolute cognition. If you're serious about it, if you're really into, if you're ready and willing to, to, to make that the noble effort to let go unconditionally, absolutely and authentically every single day, you'll start getting pretty good at it. It's like wiping the slate clean, wiping the slate clean, wiping the slate, slate clean every day. And it's why you'll start to make the effort to take care of yourself because you want to feel good. You don't want to feel bad. So you do things like exercise every day because if you exercise, there's more oxygen running through your blood, pumping through your blood you're going to tend to feel more positive. You will tend to try and avoid addictive behaviors. You'll try and avoid a relationship to life. It'll pull you down into the mud, the deep, the deep and thick layers of mud of your own and our own inertia. Now, inertia in my language, I call the irrational refusal. Inertia is the experience of an irrational refusal and it's the very opposite. The state of consciousness of inertia is the very opposite, is the very opposite consciousness of new beginnings. So inertia is what we all feel when the alarm goes off in the morning and we don't want to get out of bed. It's a big no to life. No. Leave me alone. That's when the worst part of our cell says to the other, to the others, to the world, and to life, no, leave me alone. 
it's inherently and fundamentally unwholesome. So inertia is how we feel when the alarm bell goes off and we, and we turn over, we don't want to get out of bed. Inertia is how we feel when we decide, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna exercise today because I don't feel like it. <laughs> inertia is how we feel when we eat too much. I repeatedly over and over again, eating too much, too much food, too much sex, too much alcohol. This fuels, this is driven by inertia and is fueled by inertia and it becomes a, a self-perpetuating hole that we can get lost in. When we allow ourselves to become lost in inertia, we stop paying attention because we don't care. And inertia is not just not caring, but it's not caring about the fact that we don't care. So the experience of inertia, which is something we all are familiar with, is the very opposite of the exhilarating feeling of a new beginning. And as I was saying earlier, a new beginning means nothing is wrong and all things are possible. And inertia feels like everything is wrong and nothing is possible. So what, I want, what I'm trying to say here is that um, the conscious experience of new beginnings, of a new beginning, can be your experience every single day in one form or another. But you're going to have to be willing to work for it. Some days it'll, be, it'll come easy. Some days it'll be free. Some days it'll just be there the minute you wake up in the morning. And other days you might have to work for it. But this is the state of consciousness that, may, that makes life worth living and, may, and, and it's what enlightenment is all about. Part and parcel of new beginnings has to do with the freedom from karma. Because when you, when, you, when you begin to meditate or when you begin to wake up, when you begin to experience higher states of consciousness, you will discover parts of yourself that are inherently free, inherently liberated, unstuck, inherently unstuck and unbounded. And the parts of yourself that are inherently free and unstuck and unbounded are inherently free from karma also. So when you, <clears throat> when you begin to wake up deep, when you begin to wake up at a very deep level, you begin to have greater access to these deeper parts of yourself that are unscarred and untar untarnished and are inherently already liberated from the very beginning always they don't need to be worked on or developed but that's their, their natural state of being is inherent liberation in a lot of the enlightenment teachings it's called awaken to the true self or in evolutionary enlightenment we also call it the authentic self and when you awaken to what's called the true self or, or your own authentic self You'll have the shocking revelation of discovering a deeper and more, and more authentic part of your own self that's never been hurt, wounded, or traumatized or victimized in any way. Even if your ego has been hurt, wounded, traumatized, and victimized many times, terribly and tragically, and is still suffering greatly as a result, when you awaken to your true self or your authentic self, you will discover to your shock and surprise that your true self which, which you remember always feels more authentic and always feels more real, has never been hurt, wounded, or traumatized. And your authentic self, in the same way, has never been hurt, wounded, or traumatized. So then you, then you, then you, you realize and you directly experience the ecstasy and the, and the inherent glory of your own already liberated true self, your own already liberated authentic self. Now I know this is hard to get if you haven't had the experience. 
but this is remember this is the this is an enlightenment context it's not a psychological context so i'm speaking about an experience of transcend of, of a radical transcendence of the small self not avoidance of the small self i'm not speaking about spiritual bypassing but the point here to repeat and i can't repeat this enough he said, when you awaken to and discover a deeper part of your own self that you recognize to be more real, more authentic, more true than your ego ever has been, and that part of yourself has never been hurt, wounded, traumatized, or victimized, and is inherently free from fear and doubt, and is inherently always vibrating with nothing is wrong and all things are possible and you gain more and more access to that part of yourself you can live you can live the state of consciousness of new beginnings every single day as i said sometimes it'll come easy spontaneously naturally and effortlessly and other times you may have to work for it god forbid but this is the miracle of enlightenment and awakening to enlightened awareness and it's a miracle that not enough people know about because while a big part of living the spiritual life in earnest has to do with work, hard, hard spiritual work, working on ourselves and training ourselves to be a more conscious person, which is part and parcel of what the living the spiritual life in earnest is all, is all, is in, is all about. Still, If we have this experience of, of awakening to and, and discovering a part of ourself that has never been hurt, wounded, or traumatized, and that is inherently free, and that is, and that is even more importantly, more real and more authentic than the small self, than the part of ourself that has been hurt, wounded, and traumatized could ever be, this this will inspire us to no end to want to do all the spiritual work we need to do to, to gain permanent access to this deeper and more authentic part of our own self. It will become much easier for us to work for our own liberation, to work for our own enlightenment if we have a taste of what it actually is, rather than having to take somebody else's word for it and not having any idea what it's all about. So once again, if you actually have a taste or direct experience of enlightenment yourself, if you're afforded the possibility of awakening to your own true self, your own authentic self, and experience its own inherently liberated nature, the profound, and, the, and the inherent profundity of that and the miracle of that, that will inspire you to know and to do any spiritual work that's necessary to straighten yourself out and to clean yourself up. Because just because you awaken to your true self and your authentic self, that doesn't mean your karma is going to disappear but it means that you will awaken to a part of yourself that is free from your own karma. It doesn't mean the karma disappears. You still have to do the work that we all have to do to free ourselves from karma. It doesn't go away. The work needs to be done. But you'll be much more willing to do the very hard work to liberate yourself from the karmic bonds from the past. So your true self has never been hurt, wounded, traumatized, or victimized. Your authentic self has never been hurt, wounded, or traumatized, or victimized. Your true self is always inherently free. Your authentic self is already always already inherently free. And a big part of the work is getting to know that part of your own self intimately. And not only getting to know it intimately, but choosing choosing to give your authentic, your true self and your authentic self greater hierarchical value or importance in your life i choose to give the significance of my true self i choose to give the significance of my authentic self and their inherently liberated nature more significance then I'm going to give my 
the story of my ego and its suffering. I'm not going to deny its suffering. I'm going to have compassion for myself and others. And I'm going to do all the work I need to do to free myself from that suffering. But that's no longer going to be put on my altar as the most important part of my life. Because when we, and that's why I keep repeating, when we endeavor to live the spiritual life in earnest, we make that fundamental shift from relative reality to absolute reality, relative truth to absolute truth, relative consciousness to absolute consciousness, relative cognition to absolute cognition. That means you're living for, <laughs> to put it in a mythical religious language, it means now I'm living for God. So if we want to, if we feel this absolute, this absolute metaphysical principle is the source of liberation and the source of truth, then we have to, we have to give it more significance. And not, not as a way to avoid anything about relative reality, relative truth, and relative, the, relative the infinite relative challenges of human existence. But we want to embrace the human experience in all, its, in all its infinite challenges from the vantage point of the of highest absolute spirit, that we aspire that to be our vantage point. It's where we want to endeavor to engage with the human experience from. However imperfectly we're gonna do that, that would, that would be our aspiration. It's, it's a high and noble aspiration. But it's a very particular and very specific one. It's one in which we're giving heaven a little bit more significance and relevance and reality than we are earth. So the experience of this is the experience of new beginnings, the, the, the consciousness of new beginnings is always found in heaven itself. Now that doesn't mean on earth that nothing is wrong and all things are possible. <laughs> But, but understand that the idea here is that if you, if you have access to the consciousness, to this highest state of consciousness that comes from having access to heaven, that nothing is wrong and all things are possible, and then you, then you bring that conviction, that, in, that awaken and inspired spiritual conviction with you and through you as you embrace the inherent challenges of being a human being an imperfect human being in a fractured world, then you will bring you will bring you will bring light and hope and love and passion and compassion down into this world through your imperfect vehicle. What we want to do in a teaching like this, which is so inspired by an integral perspective and integral philosophy, is we want to embrace it all but we want it all to be informed by the highest principle first and foremost. We want to give the highest principle the greatest, the greatest significance hierarchically as we put this picture together and learn how to relate in the most spiritually enlightened way as we understand it to the overwhelming complexity and challenge of being human in a fractured world.